Writer and producer Joseph Malazzi joins us live on Midnight's Edge in the Morning. Good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is, where you is. We got through another week. It's Friday. Welcome once again to Midnight's Edge in the Morning. I am one of your hosts, Tom Connors. With me is my co-host and the boss man, Mr. Andre himself. Greetings, Tom. Greetings, everyone else. Greetings, everyone in the chat. And greetings, special guests. Yes, yeah, sorry for the delay in the start. StreamYards was having a fit. Uh, but we got around it. We figured it out. And yeah, as you heard, we have a wonderful guest with us this morning, Joseph Malazzi himself, the writer and producer on many such things as Stargate and Dark Matter. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. And also with us is Orville Nation's own PJ. How you doing? Thanks for having me, guys. We're we're very glad to have you guys here this morning, and we're going to talk all kinds of uh, industry news and sci-fi news, genre entertainment news, all kinds of stuff. And, of course, if you guys have any questions for Joseph, feel free to send them in, in the chat, and we'll try to get to a few of those before the show is done. So, Andre, uh, been an interesting week. It has indeed. Uh, it has been an interesting week, both on camera, off camera, on in streaming, on The Mandalorian. <laughs> We're going to get through all of those things. But for the time being, though, we're going to focus mostly on what you have been contributing towards, Joseph Malosi. Uh, and that's going to be a bit of Star uh, Stargate and all that other goodness. Uh, so uh, let's begin with, uh, with uh, how did you tell us, how did you get started in the industry? Because that's how we usually begin. Yeah, you know, I, I originally I wanted to be an, an author. I wanted to write books because I was a big fan of uh, classic sci-fi like Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov. And, uh, you know, I quickly learned I didn't have the patient or I thought really the scale to uh, to write uh, uh, prose fiction. Although I'd written a, um, a prose fiction novel that I gave my former writing partner and he read and he's like, this is this is terrible. But I think it would make a great script. And I never really thought about script writing before. And then I, I, I the format is fairly easy to pick up. So I, I adapted that terrible uh, novel into an equally terrible script, but it really you know, showed me how script writing works. And, uh, and I decided I wanted to be a script writer and, and I ended up um, sending out a resume like, to like a hundred different production companies, hoping to get my foot in the door as a, uh, as a script reader. And I believe like, maybe a dozen wrote back to say thanks, but no thanks. And one wrote back to say, uh, they were an animation company and they said, well, we don't have uh, openings for script readers, but if you would like to write for one of our animated projects, this is what we do. We send you a Bible, you pitch some story ideas. And if we like your idea, we buy it and we'll, we'll, pay, we'll pay you to write a script. So the very first uh, script I, ever wrote that was produced was an episode of The Busy World of Richard Scarry, uh, Patrick Pig Learns to Talk. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. Um, and, and I just got my foot in the door in animation. And then I worked my way up from animation to developing for animation and then teen live action. I did a, a series called Student Bodies for um, a three season run. And then did a couple of one hour action adventure shows and ultimately landed on Stargate is our agent at the time also represented Robert C. Cooper, who was one of the show's uh, co-creators and, and co-showrunners along with Brad Wright. And uh, we ended up on the, on the series on SG-1 for season four with the understanding that the show would go another season and season five would be the end, as was the case with most shows at the time. And we would all go our separate ways. And, and, and you know, uh, the rest is history, really. You know, we, we wrapped season five and then we learned we were moving to Sci-Fi sci Channel for season six for one more season. Uh, and then we got picked up for a seventh season. And every year that uh, we would get picked up, it was with the understanding, this is gonna be the last season of the show. And so we would write the season accordingly, so it would be the end. And we always thought it was the end, but we always kept on getting picked up until season 10, where I remember talking to actor Chris Judge to Brady Teal'c on the show, and he listed all these ideas that made perfect sense why the show would be picked up for an 11th season. 
And so that was the one season where I thought for sure we would get picked up. And that was the, the, the season that the show got canceled. So uh, from Stargate, where uh, my former writing partner and I, Paul Molly, worked our way up from co-producers to ultimately showrunners through the guidance of uh, the amazing Brad Wright and, and Robert C. Cooper. And from there, I went on to ultimately create and showrun my own series, uh, Dark Matter. In a nutshell, that's it. Yeah. So now Dark Matters, that was your own original idea? Yes. Yes. So and Joe for Oh go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead, PJ. I was just gonna say that Joe forgot to say that his writing and his contribution, I'm assuming him and Paul, was so powerful uh in Stargate that they just kept getting renewed, probably in you know, in regards to the writing, how excellent the writing was. Yeah, I, I think the writing all around, I mean I I don't want to say you know, I, I thank you for mentioning our, my contribution, our contribution, but uh, Brad and Robert had really, and Jonathan Glasner before uh, he left, really set the tone for the series. So when we stepped in in season four, they had really worked out all the bugs on a creative and a production standpoint. So really it was a well-oiled machine. And um, I think, you know, I mentioned Brad and Robert, but uh, writers like Carl Binder, uh, Martin Garrow, who's gone on to do Blind Spot and 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 various other projects. Uh, Alan McCullough. I mean, there were so many great writers on the series who were also de facto de facto showrunners who've gone on to do other things. Um, so, uh, yeah. But you're absolutely right. I think it, it comes down to the writing and and the casting. I just meant to say that a lot of the favorite episodes that I have are are directly related to you guys. That's oh, all. thank you, thank you. I mean, one of the things I loved about Stargate that I brought to Dark Matter was that sense of humor that undercurrent of humor that uh, I think fans always respond to. So thanks for that. Yeah, and uh, also you're getting a lot of love in the uh, in the chat. Oh, we have Presley you. Snipes that says, oh, Dark Matter was so good. And the ending of season three, and then no more broke me. Yeah, I'm pretty Same. sure that, uh, that uh, many feel that way. Lars V. Ding also says, oh, loved Dark Matter. Thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, loads of, um, uh, loads of um, uh, love for you right there. And also Mr. Tickle Trunk, who's a very loyal watcher, says, Joseph is too modest. It took every writer to make it work. And he was part of that. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I have a question. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. And... No, I was going to say, I mean, it's the writing, but, you know, as I mentioned, the cast had to bring it to life. And the writer, the writing and the acting was really a symbiotic relationship. I mean, you, you write it on the page, then the actors bring it to life and they add or, or subtract what they like. And then you see what, what they respond to and you, 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 you adjust your writing accordingly. Um, and then obviously the entire crew uh, from, from costumes to art department, um, kind of the unsung heroes. Uh, you know, I, I do a blog, I've been blogging for it's like 13 years now. And when I'm in production, I always like to spotlight the different uh, people behind the scenes, so production designers and 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 um, our directors, and and uh, you know sometimes you forget how many people contribute to to the project to make it great. So I thank you uh, for for mentioning me, but uh, really it was a group effort. <laughs> now, yeah, my question here is uh, one thing we've covered here on this channel quite a bit for the last few years has been the oncoming streaming wars, which we're basically in the middle of now. Mm. And from your point of view, you've worked on both uh, television like proper and with your new show, Utopia Falls is actually for Hulu, right? Uh, yeah. Um, just to qualify, it's not my show, although I did show run. It was okay. uh, created by uh, R.T. Thorne, who's a okay. uh, very talented individual. But yes, okay, well, yeah, my, my question really doesn't have much so much to do with that so much as what what is the difference uh, as far as an approach or how you guys have done things as, as it was to like something like Stargate and Dark Matter as opposed to this where something is for streaming? Is there a difference? I guess is my big question. Um, to be honest, for me, no, because uh, sci-fi was ultimately cable. And even though, I mean, one of the biggest differences is the episodic order. Um, I mean, a network, I don't know how, you know, you're looking at 24, 25 plus episodes. Right, for, for a season. major show, yeah. Yeah, whereas, network, you know, yeah. 
that's how we started. I think we started at 22 episodes per season on, on SG-1, and then they brought it down to 20 episodes a season. But that's what we would do. Um, but years later, when, when we went back to sci-fi uh, with Dark Matter, it was only a 13-episode order. And that's what you'll see in most of the streamers. You'll see 13, more, more 10 now, uh, and in some cases, eight, even six. So is that really the only thing that changed was the the amount of episodes? I mean, not even just the approach to the show overall or um, any kind of like... I, I think it's something that, that has evolved over time is the type of storytelling. SG-1 and Atlantis were very episodic in nature. Um, you know, even though there were certain uh, character elements or story elements that would uh, play out over the course of a season or more, the adventures were usually close-ended. So uh, it started with the team going off world and usually ended with the team coming back home, problem, problem solved. When we started to produce Stargate Universe, it was at a time where serialized storytelling was taking hold. So Stargate Universe, even though it had that um, episodic component, was certainly more serialized than, uh, than uh, Stargate's uh, SG-1 and Atlantis. And when it came time to uh, produce Dark Matter, I really embraced uh, the best of both worlds. I, it was a show that had uh, a closed story, episodic story, but a lot of ongoing serialized elements. Um, but I find that on streaming, you'll see a lot more serialized story storytelling. You know, it's, it's the type right. of bingeable uh, uh, television or, 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 or streaming. Uh, so would the writing approach be different in a sense, like in a normal writer's room setting on a show that's 20 some episodes, you may not necessarily, I mean, you probably have an idea where the whole arc is going, but you're not like writing the whole thing out and then going and filming as opposed to like uh, something for streaming. It sounds more like you'll actually write it all out, then go film it as opposed to the other way around. Is that what I'm gathering here? I, you know, I would say ideally, I would say ideally because um, if you've got a smaller episode order, that's hopefully what you do. Um, I know that one of the lessons I learned on Stargate, even though we did 20 episodes a season, uh, and when we were shooting Atlantis and SG-1 simultaneously, four, 40 episodes of television uh, a season, we would always try to get at least a quarter of those episodes written before we went to camera because production is like a machine. It just eats it up. So I, th that's what I did on Dark Matter. I, uh, I made sure that we had most of the scripts done before we went to camera. And you think that's a smart way to do it, which it, it is, uh, and that more production would do it, but they don't. Um, on, on several occasions on Dark Matter, we had different production personnel you know, coming and going, and they would always be amazed by the fact that we were always so prepared. Uh, whereas other productions I would hear horror stories like um, the cast, uh, being uh, emailed the script on the morning they were they were to shoot a scene or um, prepping an episode off an outline on a napkin. It's 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 insane, but it happens more than you think. So uh, it, you know, in answer to your question, the smaller episode order would ideally give you time to you know have have all your ducks in a row. But I guess it right. really depends on the showrunner. Oh, that's interesting to know. Um, looks like uh, we're getting a lot of love, like we said, for Stargate in the yeah. chat here as well. We um, also get a few uh, questions from the audience. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Chris Foster says, uh, are there any uh, SG-1 story arcs that you wish you had revisited? Furlings, Ritu, etc. Um, the Ritu were before my time, and the Furlings were kind of a landmine because Robert uh, C. Cooper... Uh, came up with a name for an alien race, and he called them the Furlings. And and uh, you know he never lived it down because you know whenever you think of Furlings, you think of those you know adorable little Care Bears of outer space. Uh, and and so I mean one of the my one of the first things he came into my office and asked me to do uh, on my first year of the show was come up with uh, a list of alien names for him. He's like I'm through uh, coming up with alien names, and I think I came up with the the Jedi and um, and a couple of other names. Um, but that was kind of funny. So uh, the Ritu were before my time. I think the Furlings were before my time. Do those stories I would like to have revisited. Um, I like the character of Sarah as Osiris. I thought she was a great villain. Uh, the fact that she was in the UK made 
uh, scheduling a little difficult. So uh, that's one of the reasons why you know we never followed up on 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 her as a character. I know uh, it wasn't my storyline, but Brad had a trilogy planned for the Ashen storyline. Uh, the episode was 2001, where they were introduced. 2010, which was a fantastic uh, um, time travel uh, or alternate uh, world episode. And he had a third story planned that just never came to fruition, sadly. Um, but just in general, I, I, I'm, a bit, I'm a sucker for time travel stories. So anytime I could have done a time travel story, provided I could get it through the writer's room, because they were always very uh, uh, you know, picky about you know, everything making perfect sense. And, and of course, that's what you want. Um, those were the hardest to do, but always I thought the more satisfying. By the way, there's been a lot of chatter about the uh, Shen episodes with all the vaccination going yeah, on. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even think about that till now. Yes. And just just so you guys know, um, so everybody knows the, the one of the, uh, the Shen, uh, well, it's a spoiler, I guess, but it has to do with uh, aliens uh, providing a certain back scene for the human so kind and so all, that's not always as it seems yeah it, uh, that, that um, was uh, oddly uh, prescient is that mm -hmm. the word i'm looking for i think so yeah it's uh, it's uh, strange when fiction suddenly becomes relevant in ways that uh, one <laughs> never had anticipated so that's pretty awesome myself. yeah, yeah. we uh, we uh, we have uh, other questions from the audience as well mills another loyal uh, uh, watcher from south africa actually so we have quite the international following not just in the panel but uh, but also uh, out there in the uh, in the audience he's wondering are you working on brad's new show um brad does not have a new show yet um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, he was in talks with MGM about a, a potential new uh, Stargate series. Um, and I have actually nothing to do with that. I, I'm just, I'm involved only in so far as I'm a friend of Brad's and he's, uh, you know, developing something and, you know, hopefully going to take it out and, 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 and land it somewhere. Um, you know, as for when production begins, uh, you know, if, who knows at that point, but uh, I, I, I will not assume anything. Well, was it Brad who said, um, or was it Brad or somebody else, Joe, that said that they were approximately at the fifth chevron of getting? That, that was actually me. Oh, that was you. That was okay. actually me. And and uh, I, you know, I, you know, someone asked, you know, what what's the progress? And I said uh, fifth chevron locked in terms of of the progress. And people have been asking, any more chevrons locked? And sadly, no, because of the pandemic, things have uh, kind of ground to a halt. Uh, for various reasons in, in Hollywood. I mean, you know, I have two shows I was going to go out and pitch in October, and I've had to put everything on hold until January, maybe, um, just simply because everything, because A, because of the pandemic, and, and, and uh, well, directly as a result of the pandemic and how it's affected production, but it's also how it's affected certain um, studios in that uh, there's been a huge turnover in personnel. And that's still ongoing. So everyone is kind of in a holding pattern right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, uh, it changes everything. On that note, Winsome Hacks also wonders, scariest SF episode any show to watch post-COVID. Well, let's stick with uh, with uh, Stargate to begin with. Uh, uh, Stargate, I, I, I will go with Whispers. Uh, you know, I would love to, to tell you which season and what episode number. But uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Is that Stargate Atlantis, Whispers? Uh, in terms of horror episodes, horror television, wow, that's a really good question. What do you I'd go, like? I'd go with the OG stand. Like the new one I'm not too impressed with, but they did a pretty good job on that miniseries back in the day. And that's mm -hmm. very current. <laughs> uh, yeah. And we got another question in here, uh, or actually uh, it says, uh, BK109 says, just wanted to thank Mr. M Malazzi for uh, this bit from 200. 200. Never underestimate your audience. They're generally sensitive, intelligent people. Yeah. WH yeah. I, I normally can read. Don't let that fool you. Yeah. No, that that is a quote from the uh, episode 200 where we, where we, it was just one of the craziest episodes we've ever done of SG1. Um and that actual line was written by Robert C. Cooper, who is a very funny guy and very respectful of the fans, obviously. 
And it was Ben Browder, right, who said it? Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah. And then I also have a question, because on uh, on the original series, then you came in uh, relatively, well, relatively late in the game, as in everything was established. Mm -hmm. uh, but on, in the later series, uh, what role did you have in establishing the Bible, the characters, everything that went into forming the series from scratch uh how how big a role did did you have in the different projects brian and how robert, was that transition yeah brian and robert were the creators the co-creators of the series so so they came up with the premise for atlantis and universe they came up with the characters and you know uh, our involvement and, and i refer to paul and mine and carl binders and and, and martin garrows uh were i mean we read all the material we we, we gave notes in the material and then when it came time to uh developing you know writing the scripts past the pilot i mean as a group we were always in the room developing the characters developing the storylines all right excellent and uh, we also have another question from from mills uh, who um, who also sent us a donation of uh, 35 south african rands uh, cool. donkey uh, would you have returned to the toll and down the road or are they dead also, how do you feel about negative fan feedback to SGU, which just so happens to be Mill's second favorite show? Um, regarding the toll, and I always say that no one ever really dies or stays dead in sci-fi. So even though their home world was attacked and seemingly destroyed, uh, I assume there were other toll out there. So that, that was always a possibility. One of the great things about uh, Stargate in general and SG-1 in particular is that we had established such a great rich mythology that i mean we could have gone on for like another 20 seasons uh, and explored so many other um, yeah, aspects as for negative fan feedback to sgu i mean uh, you know at the end of the day um uh, fans of course are entitled to their opinion i mean they're you know they 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 invest their time in a show and and you know i i i, I assume that they were used to a certain tone for SG-1 and Atlantis and Stargate Universe was different for them. Um, you know, I, I before I even actually got the Stargate gig, I was fairly active online, um, kind of checking out the fan communities. Not, not really vocal, but just seeing, you know, getting a sense of them. And, and it's something that I've, I've continued to this day. I'm fairly active in social media and, and keeping in touch with the fans, either through my blog or on, on Twitter, or, or, you know, I'll, I'll occasionally hit the Reddit, uh, the Stargate subreddits and, and upload photos, behind the scenes photos. Um, so we're very respectful of the fans. And as long as they keep it respectful, I don't really, you know, I think criticism is good. I also would like to mention that you are here right now, live with the mm. audience. Uh, so uh, yeah, massive respect for that, and I agree completely. Like if you treat the uh, treat the fans with respect, then the fans will treat you with respect back. Even even if not everyone will, may necessarily agree with every mm -hmm. single decision, right? Uh, then of course, just just the act of treating them with respect is gonna is uh, going to make a huge difference. That is something that we certainly see in our community. Mm -hmm. with the, with the I, creators I, that deal with, yeah. If I can just add, Andre, that I mean, not just not just Joe coming on Orbital Nation, but uh, if you you know you go through YouTube, Joe has been very very accessible to the fans like for for years. So. Indeed, yeah, there are many creators that could uh, could learn from this. <laughs> So massive uh, kudos. It, for, it, for to that. be honest, fandom can be a, a double-edged sword. They're very passionate. Uh, and if they like something, it's great. But if they don't like something, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, it can be difficult. And and uh, so, I, you know, I understand why I mean, some creators would prefer not to sort of wade into those waters. Yeah, uh, but I think that those that uh, that don't maybe have a reason not to because they suspect that the <laughs> fans aren't going to be so so resp uh, responsive to them. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have more questions. Mr. Tickle Trunk uh, for two Canadian dollars wonders, what's your process if starting a totally new IP? Um, if totally new, you mean an original idea. Um, it really depends. In the case of Dark Matter, I had been sitting on the idea for, 
I want to say five or six years. Uh, and then when the time came to take it out, I, I had a, a, a pilot script. And usually what you do is you go out with a pilot script and, and, and series overview and you pitch it. And if somebody likes the idea, they will buy it. Uh, but I actually got my start uh, in animation. And I was actually, I was uh, a manager of animation development for a while. And my job was to look for properties. And one of the things that I quickly became aware of is that it didn't matter how good a project was. Uh, the buyers always wanted IP. Uh, and, and by that, I mean an established property, intellectual property. So rather, if it's based on a book, if it's based on a comic book, something, something that preceded it. Uh, and so for Dark Matter, I ended up reaching out to Dark Horse, uh, Keith Goldberg at Dark Horse, and I pitched him um, Dark Matter as a comic book series that we could launch. And then depending on how it did, we could actually take the comic book series as an IP and shop it as a series. And he loved the idea at the time um, I don't think they had done any television. I think I believe Dark Matter was the first show, but they've gone on to do like some amazing. They do Umbrella Academy and, and a whole bunch of great shows. Uh, and so that's what we did. We I, I took the, the the first what would have been the first two episodes of Dark Matter, uh, adapted them to the comic book format. It was for for issue arc. And when the time came uh, to pitch it, Jay Firestone, who's the president of Prodigy Pictures, had the comic book or the graphic novel, excuse me, to go out with. And and what that did was, was really help us is, um, I always say that when you pitch a show, some executives will imagine the worst possible um, uh, um, a follow through on your idea. But if they have something visual like a comic book, they can, they can actually see it come to life. And so that's what we did with Dark Matter. And we ended up selling the show off the IP and, and, and the idea and then from there, I went, you know, back and reverse engineered the, the pilot script and uh, and moved forward. And the brilliant thing with that is that it wasn't just a, a four issue. Oh, I think we lost Andre. Over. I can hear him. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can the rest of you hear me? Yeah, I can hear Andre. Okay, okay well, just me then. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, I was about to say about Dark Matter, the comic. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the brilliant thing about that was that it wasn't just a four-issue arc. It was also released as a trade paperback mm -hmm. uh, called Rebirth, which of course uh, gives uh, gives it a whole new life for the trade paperback audience mm -hmm. that don't necessarily uh, read individual issues. Uh, is that uh, is that an approach that you would generally recommend to those trying to get into the I, uh, into the industry? Because that way, then you can kind of like say, "Look, comic book property." Yeah, I, I wouldn't really recommend it as as an approach. To be honest with you, I uh, I love comic books uh, uh, quite a bit. I mean, I, I do read, and I, I think comic books are, are their own thing. And in in my mind, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, establishing the IP was important, but I would have loved to have continued the Dark Matter story uh, as a comic book. So, uh, you know, in, in my head, I, I, I and I think of comic books, I got to occasionally come up with comic book ideas. And now I'm at the point where uh, I feel as if I ever did an original uh, comic book idea, I might actually be kind of reluctant to uh, necessarily adapt it to, to television uh, until it, I had felt satisfied and, and in, in uh, having the creative freedom to sort of let the comic book run run its course. Yeah, I understand. It's a completely different thing. Uh, we uh, we uh, also got a great question from Exia Valens, who says, mm -hmm. "What was the transition like going from Richard Dean Anderson to Ben Browder and Claudia Black?" Um, it was actually a surprisingly smooth transition. Uh, I mean, when we started um, Stargate. Richard Dean Anderson was Richard Dean Anderson, the star. And, and after so many years, I think Rick wanted to spend more time with his family. So, uh, you know, we find ways to sort of lessen the load and, and have it, you know, appear in less episodes or appear less in the existing episodes and reach the point, you know, every year Rick would say, I think this might be the last year I would do it. And then he would always come back and then finally decided, you know, that's it. I think, you know, I, I'm done. And so we were wondering, well, what are we going to do? And, uh, I'm a big Farscape fan, and uh, I love Ben and Claudia's work. Uh, and we ended up 
casting Claudia in uh, in, in an episode, uh, an earlier episode. Um, but you know, I, uh, Brad and Rob were going to have a conversation with Sci-Fi, and I said, pitch them Ben Browder. I know they love Ben Browder. I love Ben Browder. He would be perfect. And so they pitched Ben to Sci-Fi, and Sci-Fi loved him. And um, I remember Ben watching all at the time it was something like. Uh, what was it, like in all nine seasons of SG-1, uh, 180 somewhat episodes uh, to get up to speed before he actually came, landed on the show. And uh, we originally pitched for both Ben and Claudia to be seri series regulars starting in, in uh, season nine, but the network was like, well, no, no, this would be too much like Farscape, which is ridiculous, outside of the fact that they were two actors, the two lead actors on Farscape, their characters, especially um, Claudia's character, totally different. And so we said, okay, and, and Ben became a regular and Claudia, I think had like a four or five uh, episode deal. And when those episodes started to deliver, the Claudia episodes, the network changed its mind and was like, well, okay, let's let's make her a series regular. But at that point, the ship had already sailed. And we said, okay, if we get a 10 season pickup, we're gonna make her a regular. And, and, and that's what we did. So from, from a writing standpoint, uh, it was a lot of fun. I thought those characters were a lot of fun to write for, especially the Val Vala character. I kind of like, you know, kind of the lovable rogue. It, you, I remember you guys, uh, there, I think, was it an episode with, was it um, Martin the alien uh, producer? Yeah. Like he even, like they're reading a script and, and, then, and it's like they're talking about bringing in new people just to take over the lead role. And Yeah, like, he, he, pitched, like, he essentially pitches Farscape and we cut to, we did a Farscape parody, and uh, and I wrote that little scene as as a uh, Farscape fan. And I remember uh, I had written Ben as Crichton and Michael Shanks as Starks, and and uh, and Ben and Michael coming to me and saying, "I think it would be fine if we reverse the role and Michael played Crichton and uh, Ben would play Stark." And so that's what we did. And uh, you know, uh, uh, Michael Shanks as uh, as Ben Browder as. Crichton is really the highlight for that uh, that particular episode for me. Excellent. We also have some some more questions about dark matter. Rodney McKay says, "Was there ever a Netflix option to continue dark matter?" Absolutely. While, uh, others express a frustration in the chat over yes, yes. Over if the you, clip I think you were frustrated. Believe me, I was even more frustrated. No, actually, um, we did go to the Netflix, but they declined. You'll you, you note that. Uh, for the most part, uh, uh, shows on Netflix, original Netflix series, you are three and out. It's very rare that they go past uh, three episodes. And one thing I keep on saying is that uh, Netflix is a subscription model. So, um, you know, they're, they're always looking for new content to drive the new subscriber base. And in the case of Dark Matter, they already had the first three seasons. So they, in, in their mind, they already had the Dark Matter uh, fan base. Yeah, that's something we always hear is that they really, yeah, they they all they care about is like those first few seasons. Once they're done, they're over with. They don't they move along, mm -hmm. like yeah. So it's it's seemingly surprising when they do go beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mills has another question here. I know you haven't read the comics or books, but excuse me, uh, would you be interested in pitching books, comics, or audio plays that could canon continue? That would be uh, canon continuations. I, I, I assume you're talking about dark matter. Um, audio plays, I, I don't really know anything about audio plays, so probably not. Um, books, as I said, I'm more of a screenwriter than, than, than a writer of prose fiction. And someone actually did approach me about writing uh, dark matter books, but A, I'm not interested, and B, I'm really not interested in someone else writing the story I had planned. Um, comic books actually would have been an interesting uh, option. I think we reached out to Dark Horse, uh, but they were you know, not really interested in continuing the storyline. So um, kind of uh, three strikes on, on, on those three. Uh, have you considered reaching out to anyone other than Dark Horse? Like, for instance, Image, which is fully create, uh, creator-owned. Uh, is that something that you would be willing to pursue? Or should your fans just let go once No, actually, all? it's something that, you know, it, it, again, really comes down to scheduling and time. Um, I mean, season three ends on a cliffhanger. What I did for the fans was, um, I mean, bef before we got the uh, the cancellation notice, we were actually in the writer's room spinning ideas for season four. 
So what I did for the fans was on my blog, I ended up breaking down the first three episodes of season four. So you know how the, the cliffhanger is resolved and what we had planned for those first three episodes. Um, so you can find them on my blog. Just do a search for 4.01, 4.02, and 4.03. Call them uh, Dark Matter Virtual Episodes, which is great. One of the fans actually, I, I, I provide uh, little stills that I drew, for, you know, drawn from other episodes to give a little visual appeal. And then one of the fans actually made a video uh, of the first two uh, episodes of kind of the breakdowns, which is kind of fun. Excellent. Yeah. So there is that option for closure. Uh, just to see a, how the story goes. Uh, yeah. But, uh, Andre, can I ask a, a question? Sure. Um, and, and just a follow-up question to an early, uh, to three or four questions ago, Joe, about mm -hmm. uh, original IP. Is it enough for for somebody who's starting to to register with a writers guild for for to to call, like, to protect your stuff? Is that enough? Um, sure. I mean, you could just do the cheap way and and frankly mail yourself your manuscript and leave it sealed. True. But um, you know, I I know there's a lot of talk about um. This, you know the theft of, of intellectual property and, and script, but uh, I think it's actually very rare, very rare. Just because I, th I, I think productions are hyper um, aware of of, uh, of the, the consequences. I mean, and, and this is why when we're on Stargate, we could never read any fan fiction. I mean, uh, you know, fans would be like, "Oh, I'd love to write. Could you, could you read my Stargate script or Stargate story?" And we were like, "No, we can't do it just for legal reasons." And I, I'm sure it's the same for for most any show. Yeah, that's uh, the uh, the recurring advice that we have always heard is mm -hmm. never ever send an idea, send a full script. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's much easier. Yeah, you. But at the end of the day, you really can't uh, copyright an idea. Exactly, but you can copyright the script. Mm -hmm. So to to anyone out there that wants to protect themselves. Uh, for one thing, uh, the, like that, that theft isn't nearly as common as you might be uh, be afraid uh, afraid of. Mm -hmm. But to protect yourself, have a full spec script rather than just an idea. Ideas are cheap, uh, but putting it into a full mm -hmm. script that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also have Master Clockwork who says uh, SGU's fault is a is a lack in identity early on. Felt too much like Battlestar, but it came into its own as it went on, and it's a pity it got cancelled. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like I said, I I, I tend to spend time on the Stargate uh, Reddit, and someone brought up the fact that, um, you know, at, at the time when Battlestar, but you know, it was on the heels of Battlestar, so there were the obvious comparisons. But he came, he kind of revisited SGU free of the Battlestar um, uh, you know, connections. And he, coming to at it new, he actually re-appreciated really this series as kind of a standalone. And one of the things you know, people mention, all the fans mentioned is it was slow in the beginning and, and got really good uh, in season two. Um, and I, I would argue that's the way with actually most shows. I mean, you're, you're setting up uh, in season one, but one of the fans on Reddit pointed out again that, you know, Season two is so satisfying because of all the work you do in season one and building out the characters and the kind of the, the story and the scenario. So when the payoffs come, you know, they, they, they're all that more, um, you know, they, 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 they just land all that much harder. And you had some great characters in it. Yeah. You. Yeah. I mean, we had an amazing cast. Indeed. Uh, and uh, moving on is to something completely different. This is more of an inter industry question, uh, which uh, many that uh, that follows this channel are interested in. Uh, Actioncom asks, what has been the effect of the internet on the industry? So this one goes way back. From the dot-coms of the 90s all the way to present-day social media, what did you see? I mean, the way... Yeah. Which yeah, I mean, trends did you see in different I mean, the, times? The way we make television is totally different. The way they sell television is totally different. I mean, back then it was all on uh, you know on network, and and I mean, if you wanted to watch something, uh, you know, it was usually on like whatever the the big four, big three, the big four. Um, as 
the internet got big, streaming got big. So suddenly you didn't have to wait till Saturday night to watch your episode. You can actually, you know, go and you know download it illegally online, which began to sort of eat into the bottom line of a lot of uh, production companies um, who kind of scrambled and ultimately it gave rise to, um, you know, you mentioned the streaming wars, net, the Netflix of this world um, and, and, and this almost kind of this immediacy now where um, rather than going week to week, unless you're still watching network television, which is losing viewership, uh, um, you know, on a weekly basis, uh, you can watch whatever you want at your own pace. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, it, it just totally transformed the television experience from a, um, from a viewing standpoint, certainly from a, uh, a production standpoint. Yeah, that would, uh, that's quite a, quite a difference. We also see uh, the change in relation to, to movies, for instance, mm -hmm. that prior to the internet, certainly movies for quality, whereas television, again, this is just my observation, whereas television was, uh, was like more cookie cutter, whereas now that is reversed as of right. late, movies have been so expensive that they can't take any risks, whereas the compelling storytelling you find on TV and on the on the small screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder, did you have you noticed like any increased demands in terms of like the the quality output uh, over the over the years to that end? Like, for instance, say from from when you first uh, started uh, out with this, with the, the original Stargate series to yeah to up to current times, is there like any? Have you noticed any difference in requirements from the showrunners and the studio? Um, not really, in terms of requirements. I mean, I I notice, all, you know, obviously there's a lot more demand for a lot more product. But on the other hand, um, you know, as I mentioned, people they they they, they love the IP and they love. Uh, you know, they, they like original ideas provided um, they're from a, an established, like a J.J. Abrams uh, type of uh, individual. Um, so, I mean, I would say you would think it would be easier. Things have gotten easier, but they, they haven't really. I think it's equally tough to sell a show. Yeah, I can imagine. And mm -hmm. uh, then we uh, we also have a question from Nuclear Simeon, uh, Simeon, who says, Hey, Joe Malozzi, love Stargate so much. Did you ever have any plans to introduce or deal with the furlings? Uh, absolutely not. In fact, actually, we I, the fans would always ask about the furlings. So in episode 200, we did a little parody bit where we actually meet the furlings. And sure enough, they look like Ewoks. Uh, and then the planet gets destroyed, and, and that's like the last we hear of them. So uh, you know, everything in two hundred was kind of uh, kind of a, a dreamlike fantasy uh, fun uh, 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 element, except for that the furlings are really dead, so you can never ask about them again. Yeah, so, so everyone uh, make note of that. Never ask for the furlings ever again. <laughs> <laughs> so there's not a furling script yeah. sitting on your desk. No, and, no, uh, that furling movie that I. Yeah, and uh, Michael Connor says that he would support a dark matter Indiegogo. So there is, uh, there is Thank absolutely you. demand for a continuation. Thank you. Uh, be, beyond what uh, what can be found uh, uh, out there already. I actually have a question from outside of the chat. Yeah. One of our friends, Matthew Kadish, wants to know. He's a big fan. Ask him what happened to Eli and the other SG crew after the series ended. I'm curious if they had plans for another season. Um, you know, we never actually got the. Ch Usually, um, you know, we would we would spin ideas for season the, the ensuing season at the end of the season we were working on. But we actually never really got a chance to actually sit down and spin story ideas for season three, um, uh, because actually before we could convene the writers' room, we we got word of the um, of, of, of the cancellation. Um, over on my blog, uh, if you do like a search, I'm not sure what um, 
I think it was SGU, that it was SGU, what, what might have been and what could have been. Um, I actually break down the possible storylines we could have pursued. And at that, that you know, at that point, we, you know, I, I, we hadn't even really discussed with Brad. So they're as good as fan fiction. But, you know, if you're, if you're curious, those were the ideas I had that I would have brought to the writer's room. Very cool. And uh, Mills has another question. Uh, do you feel toxic creatives is a thing where they try to alienate the audience? Or do you think it's genuine incompetence for some picks? Uh, um, I, uh, I think that this is maybe something that is more relevant to other series, like uh, as recently has been happening on Star Trek and uh, and Doctor Who more than anything that yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in sure particular. Sort of, but, uh, yeah, I don't really follow the question. I'm not sure what you know, talks to creators. I don't think anyone uh, creator sets out to alienate uh, an audience. I, I think they always go in with the best intentions of what they assume. Um, uh, will, uh, you know, our audience will respond to, and sometimes uh, they are accurate and uh, other times they are not. So, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know, but I mean, you know, in answer to your question, um, I mean, in, in, as is the case in any line of work, there are talented uh, people and there are, there are untalented people and, and just because you're good, doesn't mean you're working and just because you're bad doesn't mean you're not working. So, I mean, I don't, you know, make that in reference to any particular show. I mean, that's the business. And you might even say that somebody who is good might just not be a good fit for a project sometimes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we had so many uh, writers uh, pitch for Stargate and they, they were really solid writers. I mean, we read their, their stuff, but they just didn't sync with, the Stargate tone, or, or they just didn't get the show, and and I mean it happens, and and it's no reflection on on you know an individual skill as a writer. It's just they're just not right. They're just not a good fit. Yeah, let's uh, let's uh, stick with that. And uh, Mark uh, Marks forty seven says, I'd love to know how you felt about SG One's Asgard theme popping up in Thor Ragnarok. That would be Marvel's Thor Ragnarok, and I mm -hmm. imagine you must have seen that movie on account of the Iron yeah. Man movie behind, or Iron Thor. Man poster behind you. Yeah, Thor Ragnarok is actually one of my favorite Marvel movies. Uh, I love I that love one too. the sense of humor in that. It makes sense, uh, which is a big plus for me. Uh, so yeah, and and yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've heard the um, both the SG-1 theme and the Asgard theme in uh, in several movies, um, it's kind of nice. Makes yeah. me wistful. <laughs> I got a I got a question that kind of goes back to Stargate. I got to imagine at some point you guys thought about or the possibility came up to do something in animation because I, I got to imagine the idea it, it lends itself to animation so well. Was that something that ever came up during your tenure, or was that just it? It never came up during my tenure, but. I believe they did do a Stargate SG-1 animated series, Stargate Infinity. Okay, see, I'm not aware of that one. Yeah, so. yeah. You can track those down. We had nothing to do with it. The writers had nothing to do with it. It was just a completely uh, alternate uh, production. I just know out of the era that the movie came out of, like everything got a, a Saturday morning tea cartoon. Right. So yeah. I'm surprised it didn't. <laughs> yeah, it did, as it turns out. Yeah, just not a Saturday morning one in yeah. quotations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Mills had another question saying In the SGU comics, Eli can't fix his pod, goes exploring and finds ancients who built Destiny on board. Was this part of the plan in the writer's room? No. Um, people ask me about the SGU comic books, and I actually don't know anything about the SGU comics. I didn't read them. Um, the people who wrote, the SGU comic books were not part of the writer's room. Um, so it's, uh, and people are always like, well, is it canon? And, you know, I would say, sure, you can consider it canon. However, if a series ever comes back, it will probably become uncanon. Right. If you ever go on the same grounds again, I, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, I, I'm sure like something like Brad is not going to be handcuffed. We're going to start spinning a story and we're going to be like, Actually, you can't do that because they already resolved that in the comic book. 
uh, I, you know, I love to be in a room when Brad is presented with that uh, uh, quandary. Yeah, it w it actually would be great to like film the reaction if someone says, "Okay, now we're going to do this," and someone says, "Ah, wait, uh, comic book did otherwise, so you can't go there." Right? No, like here's like the thing: the the comic book is uh, head canon until it's uh, yeah. rejected on screen, and then it's not even that. Or mm -hmm. You're going to have a hard time maintaining that it's even that. Uh, Sander Hammerschlag has a question. How was it to work with actors like Colmini and Robert Picardo? Or did you even get to work with them when you were it, writing their parts? In the case of Colmini, not really. I did not get down to set. Uh, but he was amazing. He was, he was terrific. Uh, Robert Picardo uh, is actually... Um, now, actually, a good friend of mine. He's, you know, I mean, I keep in touch with a lot of the cast from Stargate, but but Bob is a guy who, if I'm in LA, I'll give him a call and we'll go out for dinner. And he was in Toronto uh, a couple of years ago, and we went out for for dinner. And and you know, he he would always come to our place in in Vancouver. Um, and he was a character actually. I, I um, you know, we cast as Wol Wolsey Richard Wolsey, who was you know kind of a a over officious pain in the ass. Um, and then, you know, over the course of, of his episodes, you know, we instilled him with a bit of, of, of humor to begin to be likable in kind of an annoying way, sort of like uh, Rodney McKay was in the very beginning. And then um, when uh, Amanda Tapping left to go do Sanctuary, we had an opening uh, on uh, Stargate Atlantis for, for a leader. And so I just called Bob up and I'm like, hey, you know, would you like to take over command of the uh, of, of Atlantis. And he was like, uh, sure. And we closed the deal in, in like a day. And uh, and he ended up being a series, series regular. And, and we ended up redeeming the character. He, he came like really full circle in, in Atlantis and became really kind of a beloved character. And that had a lot to do with, with Bob, who is uh, um, just one of the most talented, uh, nicest guys uh, I've ever worked with. I love the way his character would just uh, sit in his um, room with a suit on and drink wine. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, so see, we have a few more questions. Sure. Uh, and uh, just before we get to the ones we just uh, saw, Alan Paxton says, can't believe I nearly missed this. Before I continue, everyone, yeah, please please hit like and uh, feel free to share because uh, YouTube doesn't always do a very good adv job advertising that we are, in fact, doing live streams even when we have distinguished guests such as now. So, yeah, feel free to, uh, to uh, help share this, share the link. And also remember, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, LA time is when we do this. So always be there to check it out, even if YouTube does not send a notification. Uh, but Paxton continues saying, grew up on Stargate SG-1 slash SGA. Still believe that SGU was shaping up to be something really special in its third season. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree. And in fact, actually, we had received word that we were going to get a a pickup for a third and final season. And so we kind of assumed we were coming back until we weren't. That so that offer kind of went away. So I was equally disappointed. Yeah, I think many were. And uh, our far says inspired choice hiring Robert Carlyle. Who is a great actor? He is. Uh, he is actually. Good. Robert is is great. I remember when he first, um, you know, came into uh, to, uh, was Brad's office. He he asked Brad, "Well, how you know what you know what level of Scottish accent do you want me to do?" And he did actually five, like something like five levels from um, discernible to uh, highly indiscernible. Uh, so when you hear him on screen, he his uh, his Scottish accent is uh, a lot less pronounced than he actually speaks in in real life. I remember I would run into him at the lunch line and I would sort of engage him in conversation, and at the time I, I didn't understand what he was saying just because his accent was so thick. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, pretty good. 
Uh, Jonathan wonders, or rather he says, spent my teen to early adult years watching SG-1 and Atlantis. Who were your favorite cast members to work with? Again, and, uh, and then I would like to throw on, how many did you actually get to work with? Rather, how many were you just writing the lines for? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, obviously got to work with, with all of them. Um, um, I mean, SG-1 will, will always stay, remain uh, near and dear to my heart because it was the first big production I ever worked on. And I ended up, what was like maybe six, six, four, five, six, seven, seven years on the show. Um, so, I mean, the cast was great. Um, you know, Michael and, and Amanda, especially, I keep in touch with to this day. Um, in terms of Atlantis, um, Jason Momoa was actually the one actor who would come to uh, my office and, and pitch me ideas. And, and, and it was his, you know, because of him coming to the office to pitch my ideas, I ended up writing two episodes, uh, Reunion and um, Broken Ties. I remember actually him coming into my office because he wanted to shave his um, uh, lose the dreads because they, they were bas they they were just becoming a, like an issue for him, and he had this idea for a scene where Ronan would go dark side and shave his head, and that's how the idea of broken ties came in. And I we pitched the network, hey, you know, Jason's going to lose the dreads, and we're going to do this head shaving uh, scene, and the network was like, no, no, um, his 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 dreads are too iconic, so. Um, we ended up having to wig him for, uh, I think, that final season to varying degrees of success, I would say. Uh, but it's too bad because it would have been a great scene. And, uh, you know, uh, Jason of all the Atlantis cast was the one who's always kind of coming in with ideas and kind of wanting to push his character, which you know, I, I always kind of appreciate it. On the note of Jason, it's funny mm -hmm. that he wanted to shave the dreads because when he was auditioning for the role of Conan the Barbarian, he refused to shave his beard mm -hmm. until after he was confirmed to have actually gotten the role. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, that also uh, leads to a question that is now gone from the screen, but that we that we had earlier, or rather a comment, I should say, which was, uh, how did you feel watching Jason Momoa as Aquaman back in Atlantis. <laughs> Getting uh, very started. You know, I'm going to disappoint you, but I did not see Aquaman. But I did see the trailer, and he looked amazing. Uh, I mean, he always looks amazing. And, and he, you know, he, he was just, I think he was perfect for that role. I think he's perfect in a lot of the roles he plays. Um, uh, you know, Jason was always kind of a, a big kid. And I mean that in, 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 in a wholly positive way. He's always, you know, a, a great upbeat uh, presence on on set and 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 behind the scenes, and I think that's continued uh, to this day. So very very happy for him, very proud of him. Indeed, and uh, we also had a, 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 another question regarding the comics. To follow up from that discussion from uh, Kant 3N who says, so were the SGU comics based of any existing writer's notes or did they write something completely on their own for those? Uh, because um, he wonders if he should Yeah, be the, the writer's room never convened, so there were never any ideas, so they did not work off any writer's notes. Um, you know, you know, I can't speak for Brad or Robert, um, you know, they, they may have actually reached out to Brad and Robert and said, hey, we're thinking of doing this. And Brad and Robert would, would have maybe said, like, sure. Uh, but, you know, to the best of my knowledge, there was no, um, the, the, the SGU comics are not a continuation of what anything we had planned uh, in the room. Joe, um, did you want to admit, I, I, we we saw on Twitter, like, uh, yesterday or two days ago that, um, that one of the directors for Dark Matter had passed. Oh yeah, yeah. Surprise! Kind of shocking. Uh, uh, Steve DeMarco, who directed three episodes of uh, of Dark Matter, heard um, was it the, the night before last, uh, had passed away uh, suddenly. And um, yeah, actually, it's you know you're, you're you're very sad. I mean, he you know we'd worked on on Dark Matter, um, and we had kept in touch since. And and you know he was an older director, and 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 he was having trouble, I think, landing. Uh, work in kind of this environment and and um which is too bad because if you see if you watch the episodes 
uh, he does, you know, he always did really good work. Um, so that that's, you know, kind of sad. I was going to bring it up on, uh, on, uh, on our next uh, uh, Dark Matter uh, podcast, um, uh, Orville Nation uh, uh, episode. But uh, yeah, yeah, very sad. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> and uh, ActionCom, who previously wondered about how... Um, uh, the internet had changed writing. Uh, he says, in reference to my internet question, how did the fan slash show relationship change over time? How was fan feedback processed? Um, you know, there kind of there's a very fine line. There are certain writers and producers who just won't go online. Like my writing partner, Paul, completely unaffected by, by the internet because he just doesn't follow any of the fandoms. Um, you know, I, I would follow the fandom and, you know, I, it was always interesting to, to, for me to see what worked for the fans, what didn't. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, you, you've got to be aware that, um, I mean, you're, you're, you're writing a show that hopefully will appeal to the fandom if you're doing something like uh, an established IP. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you, you kind of don't want to take dictation as well because the the fandom is is splintered. And there, you know, I remember when we were on on Stargate SG One, there were the shippers who shipped um, O'Neill and Carter and wanted to see those two together. And then there were the slashers who shipped uh, Daniel and O'Neill and wanted and didn't want to see uh, Carter and O'Neill together because that would mean that it would totally um, undermine their uh, relationship. So I mean, it's it's interesting and 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 you know fodder for fan fiction. But um, as writers, you can't really let uh, fandom dictate what you can and can't do. I mean, it's always great to be informed uh, and and you know to reward fans whenever possible. But you know, as as writers, you have to sort of hopefully see your your original vision through. Uh, speaking of original vision, uh, Mills also wonders if Atlantis were brought back, do you think you could Jace get Jason back or would that be too pricey? Uh, would it be too pricey to bring back most of the cast today? Yeah, I, in all seriousness, I don't think if we ever, you know, did a new Stargate series, I don't think it would be a continuation of any of the other shows. Uh, it would probably be a new series with new characters existing within the established Stargate universe that would allow for a lot of these familiar faces to maybe do guest spots or, or you know, appear over time. Um, in terms of getting Jason, I think probably that ship has sailed. Um, y y besides the cost, I, you know, I, I think... Jason has gone on record as saying that, you know, he had a great time on Atlantis, but it's, you know, he's kind of put it behind him now. So uh, unlikely we would get uh, Ronan back. Mills has uh, a follow Oh, go ahead, Andre. Yeah, no, no, you take it. Up. So Mills has a follow-up here. says, was SGU canceled due to MGM bankruptcy or ratings related? Uh, you know, on the surface, it would look like... Uh, Ratings, because I mean, the ratings were down, and and, and you know, the, the show be, due to the ratings was going to end either with uh, where it did season two or with a third and final season. Um, I don't think the MG Gym bankruptcy. I mean, it certainly complicated mudding the waters. I don't think they really had anything to do with um, one had the, nothing to do with the, the other. The can, yeah, the, yeah, the, the cancellation. I think really. Uh, we were heading down that road anyways, and I think there were uh, other issues that uh, brought about the cancellation is what I want to say. Yeah, well, it's my understanding from uh, some things I've heard that MGM isn't the only ones involved with Stargate anyway, correct? Like there are some other people that do have some uh, holdings to it or no? No, not it's really. It's MGM only? Okay. Yeah. All right. That was what I was curious about. Ball is in the New court. Yeah. I, I've kind of asked you this question before, but uh, Tom and Andre, um, you, Midnight's Edge talks about it a lot. They talk a lot about James Bond and, and MGM. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's, there's the reason I'm asking is because there's so much of their audience has has has, has been on this point. Mm -hmm. Do you, does 
does the the success or failure of another franchise affect how MGM looks at Stargate? Um, you know, I can't speak for MGM. I I would I would think not. Um, you know, if 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 um, I don't see how like the 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 success of let's say a James Bond would affect Stargate. On the other hand, um, I mean, the only way a a, a failure of, of of a James Bond entry could affect Stargate is if if is if it would make uh, executives um, cautious about um, how to proceed with uh, the franchise. But uh, I would argue that uh, given it's been it like eight years since uh, Stargate went off the air, and we're seeing reboots of everything from uh, Gossip Girl to Full House to Walker Texas Ranger to uh, True Blood. Uh, to Battlestar, um, I don't. I have a hard time believing they could be any more cautious. All right. Uh, and Alan Paxton wonders: mm. Has Joseph ever thought of where he would take Stargate if the opportunity at a revival presented itself, and what would that elevator pitch be? Uh, the answer to that is no, because I am I would not be presumptuous uh, enough to sort of step into that role. Um, that is really much sort of a, very much you know Brad and Robert were the co-creators of Atlantis and, and Universe, and, and you know Brad was a co-creator of all three Stargates. And if anyone's going to bring back uh, Stargate and come up with an elevator pitch, it would be him. So uh, um, out of respect for. Uh, for Brad and Robert, uh, I, I would not be the one to uh, come up with an idea. But I mean, I will say in a general sense, what I would love to see would be a, a, a series that would appeal to new viewers of the franchise who wouldn't need to know anything about Stargate before tuning in, and yet at the same time offer um, a reward for long, long established fans in the way of maybe you know familiar faces maybe a rodney mckay maybe a samantha carter um putting in appearances here and there maybe the resolution of some storylines oh, that's uh, very fair and uh can uh, three yeah sorry can carry on tom i was just curious um was there any involvement at all from dean devlin or roland emmerich uh, on the series at any time or was that just they were just the movie only and then mgm just after that was the only ones in control yeah, no, it was it was Jonathan Glasner and Brad Wright, uh, right. SG one throughout, and and uh, and um, uh, Devlin and, and and Emmerich. We had no uh, involvement in the in the television series. Did, didn't you share one? Is it my imagination? Did you share one time, Joe, that uh, Kurt Russell had had actually been on set? Yeah, actually, he was shooting. Uh, was it three thousand miles to Graceland <laughs> on the uh, on the lot? And so he came and he visited. Uh, um, uh, the set, and he actually was very impressed with the Stargate, the fact that it actually did uh, spin, because apparently his Stargate did not spin. <laughs> oh, there you go. There's some there you go. production value there. Yeah, yeah. because I was um, just kind of curious if there was any real connection between the movie universe and the TV universe as far as production-wise. No, not from, from the production standpoint. And uh, Can3N wonders, did the galaxy hopping element make SGU tough to write long-term arcs for, or was it more of a blessing to try brand new stories as it went along? You know, I, I really love the galaxy hopping element. Um, it certainly was, it did make it uh, challenging to a certain degree. I mean, on, on SG1, we, you know, after so many seasons, we had, we had laid so much groundwork in terms of mythology, in terms of, of story arcs, that we could always go back and 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 dip into those uh, in, into those stories. SG One was all new, so it was challenging, but it was also creatively creatively very satisfying. And then Diego Flores sends in a question here or a statement. When you, uh, have you or uh, no, it's a question? Have you ever thought of taking SG into a type of movie universe, self-contained stories, but with a clear connective tissue, not a cinematic universe, but more like one of the movies? Now, of course, I, I, I know you don't have control over this, but mm -hmm. if you were in this position, I guess that's the question uh, Diego would like to know. Yeah, I know. I love the idea, and and you know. Um, you know, I, 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 as I said, I mean, you know, I, I, I defer to to Brad 
But um, given the opportunity, yeah, I think that, that that would be a great idea. All right. And Joe, go ahead. if I may ask, uh, because I know there's a lot of people in the audience who do this kind of thing, what are the what are the fan film policies for Stargate and, and for that matter, Dark Matter? That's a very good With question. regard to Stargate, I have no idea. Uh, but I mean, MGM is a big studio and I'm sure they keep kind of on top of that. Um, uh, with regard to Dark Matter, I mean, it's only Prodigy Pictures and, and to be honest with you, I don't think they really mind. Uh, or I was gonna say care, which is kind of true, but, uh, and then, you know, neither do I. I, uh, you know, it's always likes to see fans being creative and, uh, coming up with new things. Sure. I got to imagine, unless somebody's obviously making some kind of profit off of something that yeah. wouldn't have any issues. Yeah. Yeah. I would think. And then Mills comes in with another one. Thank you so much. Where do you see the main characters today? Oh, it really depends on which characters. Um, yeah, that's a broad swap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I think, I think Teal'c is leading the free Jaffa. Uh, um, Daniel Jackson is, is, is back to teaching. Uh, General Carter is is is, uh, is uh, probably in command of uh, the new uh, Stargate command, and then goes home to her husband Jack O'Neill, who uh, who is uh, you know homebody and makes makes delicious uh, spaghetti dinners. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, in terms of Atlantis, I think Atlantis has found its way back to the Pegasus Galaxy, and uh, and uh, you know the fight continues to this day. And uh, uh, who did I leave out? Uh, Cam Cameron Mitchell and uh, and Valor are still part of uh, of, of, of uh, an SG team somewhere out there. And and uh, in terms of uh, universe uh, uh, crew, they're still in uh, stasis aboard the uh, the Destiny. And of course, basically, they're they're the uh, the pods um, are I don't know how many. You know, how, you know how many hundreds of years old? Um, so they're not, in my mind, perfectly preserving them. I think, you know, if and when they do come out of stasis, um, how many years from now it'll be almost like I don't know, maybe eight, even nine years have passed. It will look like, um, but uh, they're still out there, traveling the galaxy, and I, I think uh, Eli is is maybe still working on the solution, but also working out a lot. I don't know if you've seen David Blue lately, but he has uh, gotten uh, super fit. Totally. I think That's you fun. really got your uh, super chats worth there, Mills. Thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, Vector1 sends in a question. Any Stargate games in the works to build hype? I believe there is a role-playing game out there. Um, uh, Was it in Dial the Gate, I think? that had Yes. Walter numbers? Yeah, actually, the dial the dial the gate team actually ended up playing the role playing game and and uh, and having a lot of fun. I think Wyvern Games. Is, is that that's, game it, that's it. That's it. Yeah. 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 All right. And then uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk has a question here. Curious if you're working on anything right now. Um, I am working on uh, several things. I have actually two sci fi projects I'm, I'm going out with uh, in January. One of them is. Um, they're both actually time yeah, time travel uh, shows. One of them is a show called Timescape that I've been developing for almost like two years now. And um, if you like the funny episodes of of, uh, of Stargate, like, like if you liked Window of Opportunity, if you liked uh, Dark Matters all the time in the world, or or um, um, isn't that a paradox? Uh, this is the series for you. It's kind of a, a sci-fi comedy we'll be going out with. We're actually going out to to a well-established actor to try to get him attached before we go out. Um, I am actually working on two other original uh, sci-fi uh, ideas. One is is a near future android murder mystery. Uh, and the one I'm working on now is this crazy uh, far future, near future sci-fi series that combines gaming, uh, anime, science fiction, and K-pop, uh, which is kind of wild. And uh, and next year I will start adaptation uh, of a fantasy book series. I can't say what it is uh, yet because uh, the official announcement hasn't been made yet, but I had a great conversation with the author and we're very excited to move forward with, with that.
that. So, and then, then there were a couple of other things, balls in the air, but um, I mean, who knows? And like I was saying, there, there was another project that just, uh, a script I wrote seven years ago that I just got a call about uh, or an email about uh, yesterday that looks like it's, it's, it's under serious consideration at one of the streamers. So um, we'll see how that turns out. There you go. And Estelin Burkholder wants to know your favorite episode. Uh, my favorite episode of... I'm assuming Est Stargate. Uh, Stargate? Uh, I would say my favorite episode was Ripple Effect. Um, just because it was very satisfying to write. Um, and it's one of those episodes that was just kind of completely bonkers. Um, that sees there's something, there's a mishap with the gate and various alternate SG-1 teams start arriving at our SGC and we have to deal with it. And, and we ended up and end up crossing paths with a, uh, dark side, uh, SG-1 team and matching wits with them. And that was just, you know, I look back at that one. It was a lot of fun to write and a lot of fun to, to watch as well. All right. Sure. Um, oh, go ahead. Joe. Uh, can I, yeah, just, um, maybe you could, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of Stargate fans who have not watched dark matter yet. Oh, and maybe you can explain, be? well, there's some, some haven't, <laughs> But uh, maybe you can explain how you got greenlit a Dark Matter um, Stargate crossover. Oh yeah, I mean, after Dark Matter uh, was canceled, um, I ended up having some conversations with uh, executives at MGM who floated the idea of potentially saving the series. And one of the things we talked about is the potential of you know, bringing back Dark Matter and doing a possibly a bit of a crossover uh, with uh, some Stargate characters, which appealed to me. I thought it made sense because from a uh, tonal standpoint, if you loved SG-1 and Atlantis, you should really check out uh, Dark Matter because it's got that sense of humor, that kind of fun sci-fi. Um, uh, and, you know, unfortunately it never panned out, but it was, you know, very seriously under consideration for a while. So check out Dark Matter. If, you, if you're, you're, if you're a Stargate fan or a, fa a Farscape fan who has yet to see Dark Matter, rectify that immediately. And, I, and I then join mean, us. I didn't, mean there, I didn't mean there was a lot. I mean, there's some who hadn't seen yeah. Dark and then, Matter. And then there join you. us every Monday night with the gang at Orville Nation where we, there you go. we discuss uh, an episode every Monday. There you go. And uh, I did share the link earlier and I believe it will be in the description as well. So if you guys, uh, you guys should check out Orville nation. If you haven't already straight white mage asks, uh, I want Stargate worlds, the online MMO to come back, let fans build their own stories in universe. I, again, no, that's more of a statement than a question, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, is that kind of what you guys are working on now? Or is it something completely different? Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with the MMO. No, that would probably be its uh, be its uh, own thing. But I agree yeah. completely with the statement. Yeah. So it's well stated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is indeed. Uh, so uh, do we do we do you have any more super chats, Tom? I think I saw one. Let me. I think there's yeah, there is one at least one or two more here. Yeah. Uh, Diego Flores sends in another one. As a sci-fi fan, I wish to know: Do you see the possibility of a space opera series actually being made? In the current era, or due to the beer bug, that kind of show is not possible to be produced. Well, it's it's actually totally possible to be produced in terms of uh, you know production. I think a, you know, a a a spaceship based series would probably be the easiest to produce because you're dealing with a set amount of characters on one set, as opposed to you know going out into crowds or 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 what have you. So um, you know, for, with regards to the pandemic reasoning, it's very doable. Uh, in general, though, I find I think um, buyers tend to be very le uh, leery of, of space operas, uh, far future. They they tend to prefer more uh, near future sci-fi along the lines of a Black Mirror, which yeah. is too bad. Not I mean I love Black Mirror, but I mean I, I do love space opera as well. Speaking of uh, other shows that you're not working on, what, what's something that you're not working on currently that you're a big fan of? And it doesn't have to be sci-fi, obviously, but just what's something that you're really into just out of curiosity lately, even a couple things, if not. 
Uh, you know, that's a very tough question because I always get this uh, question. And, and honestly, when I, for a guy who works in television, I really need to watch more television. Um, uh, you know, I just finished watching a show called, uh, in, in Japanese, is Arisu and, and Borderland um, on, uh, on Netflix, which I loved. Um, I'm, to be honest with you, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, anime guy. So uh, my wife and I are rewatching the original Neon Genesis Evangelion. Uh, so that's that's what we're doing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I tend to read a lot. Although I read less this year, I tend to watch um, more anime, which I've done quite a bit of this year. Doro Hidoro, um, um, uh, The Promised Neverland. I don't know if it probably means anything to you, but uh, all great uh, anime shows. And in terms of uh, live action television. It's tough. I mean, you know, uh, like a sh I watched The Queen's Gambit, which uh, which I liked. It's not a show that I, I don't think I would be suited for, uh, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, I've been trying to sort of work my way through some um, horror movies. You know, they always put out those lists of top 10 horror movies, and then you watch them, and you're like, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> there's a, there was a, what did I watch? I watched three horror movies. One of them was actually, I think it was either Swedish or Norwegian. Oh, which one? Uh, now I'm interested. Which one? Was <laughs> it? Was it co Cocori Cocoda? Uh, yeah, no. the, the, the end of there sounded Swedish, but... Uh, yeah, but and uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, His House on Netflix, which actually was was a pleasant surprise, I, I did like. And then a couple of other ones that uh, were I would not recommend. So uh, I try to sort of uh, watch a bit of everything. If you guys have something to recommend, uh, I'd love to hear it. Cobra Kai. Yeah, a friend of mine it's got karate. Man, it. Cobra Kai. All that matters. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, a friend of mine right, man, Cobra yeah. Kai. I almost, yeah. I almost uh, did the. We have a joke around here when you were talking about your one show. I almost did ask, but yeah, but it doesn't have karate in it because that's one of our ongoing shows. Yeah. Here. Trying, of course, I see you're a fan of Judge Dredd, which is. Uh, which oh, is, I love Judge Dredd. Which yeah, uh, is one of Andre's favorites. Yeah, absolutely. Both the comics and uh, and the 2012 movie. The, yeah, nice, the, the 2012 five, movie is actually one of my favorites. It's a. It's a. Uh, I would argue, sort of a, a uh, an over uh, overlooked gem. Um, it really is great. Absolutely, it's such a shame that the the marketing from Lionsgate at the time, mm. or a complete bomb factory, utterly dropped the ball so badly. Well, I do hear a TV series is in the works. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, I happen to to know a little bit about it. Um, mm. so they're back to square one after going in huge circles, and I we actually reach out to the producer. I just because we follow each other on Twitter, and I'm like, hey, you know, I hear you're working on a on a, a Judge Dredd series. If I can be a totally anywhere. Sure. You know what? Uh, if you if you reach out, you may just find that maybe I don't know what's going on like right now in this moment, but I know that as of a few months ago, they were back to square one. They had mm. to start over completely. So if you were to reach out, you mm. never know. You never know because mm. yeah, back to square one. There, mm. I don't know if they have found anyone new to take over or something, but uh, they they might be uh, they might be interested. Mm. So that's uh, one tip I can give. Thank you. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with that, uh, uh, we are caught up on Super Chat. So I would uh, like to thank you for taking the time to, to join us today. It's been an absolute yeah, blast and an honor to have you on. And also, uh, thank you to Orville Nation for, for, uh, for joining us, for setting this up. And of course, everyone here, you like this, you should check out Orville Nation. Because uh, Joseph, you appear um, appear on there from time to time. So uh, also, again, on, give on, us the pitch. I'm on Twitter under Baron Destructor. So if you had questions that didn't get answered, you can come uh, hit me up on Twitter, and uh, and I'll try to field them to the best of my ability. There you go. Just don't be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so no, we, we really want to thank you guys for helping us out today. And, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Joseph. Uh, it's always fun to talk to somebody who's in the industry and especially somebody who's had a long career like yourself in, in sci-fi, especially it's, it's always a pleasure to get to, to pick the brain of somebody who knows what it's like on the inside. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. And Thanks for having always, 
Joe is so prolific. He he does he works so much that he he might surprise us uh, all of a sudden, like he said, like something you wrote seven years ago. So who, <laughs> who knows know. what he's or, got? Up to or I'll give it all up and raise llamas for a living. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. All right. All right. Well, we'll be the, we'll be back here hopefully uh, this afternoon talking about Mandalorian. So you guys want to check back for that. Otherwise, we'll see you Monday morning for Midnight's Edge in the morning. Uh, until then, everybody take care and take care of yourself.